and we are going to go live we are live now actually okay but we're going to go live on facebook now hello everybody my name is etn fontan i am here with a great group here for our vac uh, round table number 30 30 already wow hard to believe that needless to say let's see, get that propagated into there Page. Excellent. So today's conversation is centering around a unique discussion. Um, we're going to be focusing on interstate commerce and why interstate commerce. Well, currently there are 37 medical states as of this week. Thank you, Mississippi. And currently, which means there's only 13 states left for medical access. Uh, and then we have 18 adult states with potentially 25 coming on board in 22 uh, with Ohio, Florida, Arkansas, North Dakota, uh, Missouri, Oklahoma, and South Dakota. So uh, there's a lot of initiatives out there. So stay plugged in and what's happening. However, we're very fortunate to have a special guest join us to explain about <clears throat> now that we have all these little 10th Amendment pockets of cannabis realities throughout the United States. Um, the reality is, is that we're seeing gluts of too much cannabis in some states. We saw that last year in Oregon. Uh, of course, we saw that uh, last year as well with California. And with those types of uh, cannabis stagnating, uh, it enters other states into the issue in the sense that um, California would like to be able to export its cannabis and many states that are represented here tonight would like to receive that cannabis. Uh, I myself would like to have access to some wonderful Madanuskan thunder <clears throat> uh, from Alaska, but unfortunately I can't get outdoor Alaskan here in California because it is illegal and it is uh, federally illegal, even though we are tolerated in our 10th amendment realities in our states, once that cannabis or money crosses that state line, it now becomes an interstate commerce case and becomes a federal crime. That goes for mailing, that goes for transporting it yourself. Uh, that's the reality of what is taking place. So with these states coming on board, uh, as we know, we're waiting for things to happen federally. I, of course, was one of the uh, creators of the National Cannabis Industries Association. And we started that to get rid of 280E, which is an onerous tax code. And of course the uh, <clears throat> um, uh, taxation as well as banking. And the reality is, is until things change federally, uh, we're not gonna see much change. However, our friend Adam Smith here has been a proponent out discussing with policymakers and various state policymakers uh, about an, an interesting concept around interstate commerce uh, so that states that potentially are bordering with each other uh, that have similar laws could start to exchange cannabis, et cetera. So uh, that is, of course, currently it's a pipe dream. Uh, it is not a reality that we're experiencing, but uh, Adam, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm I'm really excited to be here. It's a, it's an interesting topic, and I, I'm I'm I am thrilled and honored to be you know your guest on your thirtieth uh, on your thirtieth go. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to turn the uh, first question over to Michael. Thank you, Etienne. So the first question may be just slightly uh, different in in. in uh, kind of where it takes us than the rest of the questions, but I think it's important. We've had a lot of uh, discussion internally in the Veterans Action Council about cannabis seeds. And uh, one of our uh, members of the council was handed a piece of paper that was very confusing as to you know, what the legality was of buying cannabis seeds in a Virginia. And of course, in Virginia, it, it, you, there are no sales yet until the regulatory program is rolled out. So the only thing legal that you could buy as far as hemp seeds in Virginia would be hemp seeds. So of course you have hemp seeds, but then you have these state programs that are based on seed. I mean, at some point, the cannabis plants that are being grown legally in these states had to come from seed. 
and the seed had to come from somewhere. Uh, you know, it's that sort of magic that happened, right, at the beginning of the of everything in every state that we don't talk about. Well, let's talk about that for a minute, if you don't mind. And 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 sort of from that tone and from that place, how do you see the seed aspect of interstate cannabis commerce unfolding? All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hijack this a little bit and give a little sense of what we're trying to do, and and then I will I promise I will answer the seed question if that's okay with you. That's perfect. All right. So, um, so I run something called the Alliance for Sensible Markets. Uh, we are a 501c6 uh, trade association. And our primary focus right now is to open up state regulated commerce, uh, not necessarily between uh, contiguous states that share a border, but between any two states that would like to participate. Um, and uh, the way we are trying to get this done is we are right now uh, we have put together a coalition and are about to ask the governors of Oregon, California, Washington, and Colorado, uh, the four really pioneer states and the four most established producer states, if they will seek guidance from the Department of Justice um, on what DOJ would do if two or more medical or adult use states uh, decided to regulate commerce among them, among themselves. Um, and we're going this way because uh, you know, everything that we're doing right now um, operates, you know, has happened the same way. A state makes a decision to do something and the Department of Justice basically indicates that they will be hands off. And that has been the way this has gone. Um, as I like to say, waiting for Congress to fix cannabis has never been a winning political strategy. And looking at Congress now, it's a very good chance that that'll continue. Um, and so uh, we believe that, you know, as you all know, I'm sure, there is, I guess this year it's still called the Rohrbacher Blumenauer Amendment, but the budget rider that has been in place since 2013, which forbids DOJ from using resources to interfere in state legal medical programs. Um, we believe that that already protects interstate commerce, but, um, on the, but, but the political reality is that governors are not going to set up, um, are not gonna set up uh, a regulatory framework to, to do interstate commerce until they get some assurance from the federal government, from the DOJ, that they're not going to arrest everyone. Uh, but on the adult use side, you know, we finally have an administration. And while Biden is notoriously against federal legalization, he's been very clear that he is not interested in get, in interfering where the states are regulating and is fine with the states making their own decisions. Um, Attorney General Merrick Garland has also been clear, including in testimony before Congress, saying that where the states are regulating, we don't feel like that's a DOJ priority. And so uh, we have a, a strong sense that at least on medical and very likely on adult use as well, if asked by governors, they will take the same exact line that they have taken throughout uh, of the Biden administration, which is that they won't interfere where states are regulating. Um, and so this is, this is, you know, this is our mission and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we are expecting, and this is not, uh, I can't give too many details because it's not public yet, but we are expecting a bill in California this year that will mirror the bill that we passed in Oregon in 2019, which allowed, allows Oregon to enter into interstate agreements to regulate uh, commerce and cannabis uh, as soon as the federal government either gives permission via statute or indicates tolerance through a uh, Department of Justice memo or policy statement. Um, and so we're, we're expecting that there's likely to be a bill in California that'll be similar to that and very hopeful that, uh, that Governor Newsom um, will stand up and make the ask of the Department of Justice uh, for guidance on the issue. So that's, that's what's been our, um, that's what been what's our focus. Uh, and we think there's an excellent chance that we will get that ask of DOJ uh, before the middle of this year and, uh, and get an answer from DOJ by mid-year or soon thereafter, uh, then what we have done is opened up a path um, for states. And, and, and we are having conversations with folks in a lot of states um, about you know, what are the consumer states that might be interested in um, you know, further supporting their patients. Uh, you know, I think about a state like Delaware that has had legal patients for years and yet um, has really a crappy supply and is never going to have a fully fleshed out production industry um, or a state like Utah that, that passed medical but is really dragging its feet on production. Um, and so, you know, where are the states that might be 
interested on the consumer side in entering an agreement with the producer states to start moving cannabis. So that's what we are doing and what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, and uh, in terms of seeds, um, ask that question again, Michael. <laughs> that the, the seeds are like- well, you know, be, like, be, Before I uh, ask that question again, let me follow up on what you were just saying, because as you were saying that it raised a, a very interesting question to me, I think it's important. How would you foresee in that plan with a non-continuous contiguous states if they uh, may set into a pack, uh, what would keep the shipments from being like hijacked for lack of a better term by the state police and the in intervening states? Right. So, um, so clearly our, our, uh, our vision of this is that, we, is that it's not going to happen um, without the feds giving the okay, right? And we think the clearest path to do that is uh, through the Department of Justice. But if the feds give the okay, if the, if, if the Department of Justice indicates that they will not interfere with commerce that's regulated between governors, between states, uh, then we can move product by rail or air, which are both federally regulated and would stop some local Yahoo sheriff from pulling a truck over. Cool. Yeah. So the, the question was uh, really just uh, if there, I guess if there's any difference between cannabis and, and seeds, uh, in terms of, uh, of you know, the rules around sales and industry, the, the confusion around the seeds right now, you, you can possess cannabis, you can grow cannabis, but you can't buy the seeds. That seems to flip some sort of uh, one equals zero switch in some of our members' brains. You know, and, and, but, and of course, looking for cannabis policy to make sense, even at this late <laughs> um, is, uh, is, is, is can make you pull your hair out. You know, I, I don't know how to answer that, right? I don't, I mean, it's, I've always found it funny that, you know, we had these state industries pop up and there was no provision for actually bringing in the seeds to start the crops, right? It's sort of miraculous, you know, it's, it's, it's immaculate conception of cannabis, right? That it just didn't exist, it didn't happen. Um, but, uh, but, you know, they were, they were in the states or they were brought in. Um, I don't know, I'm not actually an expert on the difference in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the legality of seeds or, or transporting seeds versus, uh, you know, versus the plant. But, but the other thing I did want to mention, because, you know, ATN talked about um, how moving cannabis between states was a federal crime, but we need to keep in mind that everything we're doing right now is federally illegal, right? It's all federally illegal. It all violates the Controlled Substances Act. And under, under Gonzalez v. Raich, you know, which was specifically in the medical cannabis realm, um, you know, the federal government has, has full jurisdiction to come in and try to shut the whole thing down. And the only reason that we are uh, operating is because the feds have decided, you know, in a, in a non and, and indicated in a now rescinded memo um, that they wouldn't interfere. And, and Garland has, has reiterated that. Uh, and so moving cannabis between two legal states is actually no more or less federally illegal than having a state industry that's entirely in state. And that's that's a reality that, uh, re, you know, I appreciate you pointing out for us is that, you know, what we're doing is all federally illegal, regardless, even though uh, through my case, uh, through the eviction case, federal government tried to do to my dispensary uh, a decade ago, uh, kind of won that right in my own state. But I never forget that as my uh, accountant has always told me, don't break more than one felony at a time. So I, I do my best to try not to do that. However, Michael, I do have an answer to your question, uh, I, honestly, because I was part of the team in Maine when uh, we got uh, four of the eight permits initially. And what was devised is called a legal loophole. It is called a trip ticket. A trip ticket is when the state would assume responsibility for the responsibility of the illegality of the product. So in the sense with Maine, we could order our seeds from wherever and the seeds would then be accepted by the state and the state would then give them to us. That way, if we would not be subject to federal arrest, it would be the state if that were so to happen. So 
that is a current loophole that with your state coming online, you may want to talk to your state representatives and to your governor about so that you can legally import and other states who are watching, that's what it's called. And you can reach out to your governor's office and ask about, uh, or Lieutenant Governor uh, specifically uh, around trip tickets so that you can, even though you have gone against the national system and your state is allowing it for that, you have to have a legal way to get these genetics in because you have to get them from somewhere. They, they, I know they always just magically appear, but <laughs> now they have to be put into metric systems. They have to be numbered, they have to be batched, et cetera. So the, this is a grace period that's usually given within the state or the state sets the parameters for. It's not an indefinite trip ticket. It is for a limited time only. And you gotta know, figure out when the, the clock starts and when it finishes and then fit your realities of everything you want aspect to in between. And so I would suggest you do your genetics research in preparation so that when that has come on board, uh, you can get that and gain access. So not to step on the conversation, but I just thought that, uh, uh, I thought maybe Adam, you had a, a different representation there for what was happening, but I thought I'd just give you an idea of what is currently uh, available, so. No, that's fascinating. I didn't even, I didn't know that. That's, that is. Yeah, it's part of being experienced and been doing this for 20 some odd years and being pioneers. We find these little loopholes here and there. So Pearson up in Alaska and uh, all the others, Kendra over in Ohio, et cetera, you know, talk to your people about things like that. So, all right, uh, question number two, go right ahead. Yeah, this is uh, Wade Laughter and uh, thank you, Adam, for uh, presenting to us this afternoon. Um, I had a question about Part of what we're seeing is all these different states that are creating uh, new programs like Mississippi just coming online with uh, medical. Um, and we're seeing a wide variety of the types of laws that states are creating. And it's, it's fascinating to me. Uh, would you talk about the difference between these pacts that you're suggesting states could enter into and how that would be different than states creating new laws so that their laws match with each other. One of the things that I think is going to be an interesting part of interstate commerce is, for example, the laws around packaging and mm -hmm. what kind of things have to be on packages. Mm -hmm. uh, those are different from state to state. And God forbid that the feds should come up with a bunch of rules about right. this. Uh, so, yeah, would you, would you talk about that? Uh, to me... The state pact, this idea is a really fascinating one because it seems like a simple way to accomplish the idea of interstate commerce. And then maybe discuss a little bit what changes you might see being necessary in state law. And that's all I got, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So in an interstate compact, um, states would be free to have their own requirements, right? They wouldn't, the two states that are, that are compacting or the six states that are compacting would not have to, for example, have the same testing requirements or the same packaging requirements. But New York could say everything that comes into New York must meet this testing standard, right? And everything that comes into New York must be packaged this way. And then it would be the responsibility of those selling into that state to meet those standards, right? And so New York doesn't have to have the same testing requirement as, as Oregon, um, but I guarantee if we could sell into New York, um, you know, that within a month, every lab in Oregon would, would offer testing to the New York standard, right? There's to be a hu immediate huge demand for that. And, uh, you know, and every producer that I know, um, you know, has been very clear that they will put, they would put anything that New York wanted on their packaging if they could, if they could sell it into New York. What it will do though, is it will create an incentive between states to start coordinating some of these requirements so that you don't have this, this piecemeal, you know, New York needs this and New Jersey needs that. Um, and I think that the, um, the recent um, coming together of CANRA, which is the, uh, the regulatory agencies of, of the various uh, cannabis states have created a nonprofit. Um, and the the, one of the purposes behind that was to begin to get uh, some of these requirements lined up so that when federal legalization happens, um, you know, there's less confusion and, it, and they'll, you know, they can get as close as possible to one standard. 
Uh, you know, one thing I, I, I didn't mention is, is that when federal legalization happens, the, the Commerce Clause um, will forbid states from discriminating against legal products from other states, right? So these walls will come down under federal legalization. Now, what federal legalization looks like and, the, and you know, I don't have a lot of faith that, that the, the regulations that the feds come up with are going to be very kind to, you know, small businesses or patients particularly, uh, which is one of the reasons we'd like to get the states, um, you know, we'd like to get the states creating a regulatory framework first so that we have commerce happening so that the feds have something to pick up on rather than starting from zero. Uh, but, um, but just to get back to your question, uh, we can overcome the differences in requirements, but this, you know, the, the, a compact would require each state to have a requirement, but the states, all the states in the compact wouldn't have to have um, you know, identical requirements. Before that, uh, George Armstrong, council member. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for uh, for joining us tonight. I so does your work take into consideration the dormant uh, commerce clause, and if you could explain that. Uh, George, your your sound unfortunately. We lost your audio. Uh, I, I, I can uh, pick up if you want. It, it, it was, uh, you know, the, there are some aspects of state laws that we like that may actually in some way interfere with interstate commerce. Some, uh, you know, ways that they handle medicinal cannabis or, or whatever that veterans like. We, we find ourselves conflicted on this because we want to be able to cross state lines. We need to be able to cross state lines. We need VAs to be able to treat veterans equally in every state. Right. But yet at the same time, there are some aspects of some of these state laws that may be good models for the whole world, you know, the whole world to follow. That'll just be sort of swept away because they, you know, are in the way of interstate commerce. So that, that's sort of the question. Um, right. Well, again, so so the way we're hoping to get this set up, it becomes, first of all, it's a state opt in. Right. So states would not be required to open their doors. They, they could choose whether to enter into a compact to bring cannabis in or send cannabis out. Um, the, the Dormant Commerce Clause um, forbids states from discriminating against each other economically, right? Uh, and um, it's the same, you know, the Commerce Clause also is the reason why uh, the federal government already has jurisdiction over in-state, right? Everything that we're doing in-state is considered interstate commerce for the purposes of the Commerce Clause. Um, but, uh, but allowing the states um, to, number one, opt in, and number two, to maintain their own uh, regulations. Again, the same thing as with, you know, packaging or testing. It would it would not force the states, or should not force the states, um, to uh, to abandon their own regulations or laws that they find uh, that they find useful. What the Commerce Clause does, um, it but it ensures that product from out of state um, be subject to the same requirements and only the same requirements as product sold in state. Does that answer the question or not? Because I can keep, I can. It does, thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, up next will be Pearson. Hey Adam, thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I am sure all the other members really appreciate it like they've, they've said. Um, so what, I, I, a little, background I, I ran a transportation company through the state of Alaska for cannabis uh, getting through TSA checkpoints uh, uh, getting on commercial aircraft with uh, with a bag full of cannabis um, to go throughout the state um, uh, which I I would happily call the airport airport police and they they would meet me in a, a private screening room after TSA checkpoint or you know, during a TSA checkpoint in order to check my paperwork. And they had no idea what they're looking at, obviously. But um, but uh, be, besides that, I mean, so that's a federal, TSA is a federal uh, organization, obviously. But what what have you learned from Oregon that can be applied from uh, to California? Um, I know up here in Alaska, we're, we're in a whole different world, um, but... But when it comes to continental U.S., the uh, Oregon from 
uh, to California. Is there anything that, that can be applied that would be significant? Well, I mean, the bill that we're expecting in California is, is modeled on the bill that we ran in Oregon, right? And, and you know, it was an interesting experience running the, that bill in Oregon. Um, we were told initially, oh, yeah, it'll take you years to get this through, and it's really radical, and it's totally insane, and who would ever think this? And uh, But the truth is that the bill that we ran in Oregon was 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 not radical at all it was very it was it was pretty easy and we got bipartisan support and what it what it essentially said when it boiled it down is you know once the federal government gives the okay whether that's again through legalizing through statute or D doj saying it's okay with us um once the federal government says it's okay can our businesses participate in an interstate market and it got very difficult for legislators to be against that Right. I mean, you know, you have an industry and we're not, you know, we're not asking anybody, we're not asking the legislators to authorize, you know, going out and risking, you know, everyone getting arrested by the feds. We're just asking and saying, hey, once the feds say, OK, can our businesses participate? And suddenly that seemed like a really reasonable rule, right? a really reasonable bill. It really just got state law out of the way for the eventuality. That, that the Fed said this was all right, and then our businesses could jump in rather than then have to come back and spend two years, get a bill passed, make it legal through the states. And so I think we learned that, and we learned a lot of the messaging on why the state laws should allow this to happen. And, you know, but the other thing we learned is that getting that bill passed is not in itself, will not in itself um, create commerce, right? What we need is the executive branch, we need the governors, to, to instruct their regulatory agencies to create a regulatory framework for that commerce and to okay, you know, it's to okay it beginning, right? And so, um, you know, the other thing we learned and, and that's applicable from Oregon to California is that, is that the Oregon farmers heard this and immediately thought, oh, California is gonna send all their cannabis here and put us out of business. And now I'm working in California and, and the farmers in Northern California are saying, oh, this is a plot for the Oregon farmers to send all this, all their cannabis here and put us out of business. And the truth is that sending $200 a pound cannabis back and forth over that border isn't going to help anybody, right? And so we're being very clear, you know, and the truth is if, if we pass this in California and suddenly there was an agreement just between Oregon and California, um, they would never find my body in Southern Oregon. I mean, they, I, they would, they, I, that would be the end for me, right? Nobody, and, and, and the, I mean, the, the, the funny thing is both, both sets of farmers believing that the other side was just, you know, sitting there waiting to, you know, put them out. Um, but we've had to be very clear that what we're doing is, is trying to find out if there is a pathway through the states. And then the next move is to bring in consumer states. And what I mean by consumer states is states where it's more expensive, um, where it's impossible to grow outdoors, or it's more expensive to grow, or less sustainable to grow. Um, you know, there are, there are thousands of farms here in, in the Pacific Northwest that you know are, uh, are that are stuck with cannabis that are trying to sell it for three hundred dollars a pound, where cannabis that's nowhere near as good and far less sustainable is being sold in, in newly legal states for you know eighteen hundred and twenty five hundred dollars a pound, right? And so, yeah. and so we need to really um, what I a lot of what is applicable is that um, is that the producers are are especially out here. Are, um, are very nervous and rightfully so because basically they've done everything right and they've gotten screwed the whole way through. Um, and so uh, being very, um, you know, being listening and, and being very clear that what we're trying to do is open consumer markets, um, that's, been, that's been super important. Uh, and, you know, and that I've also learned that, um, uh, that we're about to, you know, in both states, we are looking at the collapse of the soul of the cannabis industry, right? The Oregon and California, and, you know, I speak of them, we're not the only two producer states, and I understand that, but it's a little shorthand, but I'm out here. Um, and Oregon and California has provided, you know, 80% or more, some people say 90% or more of the domestically grown cannabis for generations in the country. And you know, and now we legalize and we have all these folks that have put everything on the line. You know, they've put their homes up and their, and their farms up and, you know, they've, they've put all their money in and they've done everything right. And now they are looking at, um, you know, a wholesale collapse of their production industries. 
uh, at, you know, at the same time when um, in these limited license states, uh, you know, six boardrooms are controlling 60 and 70 and 80% of production um, with cannabis that would never compete, right? Um, and so it, this is really about, you know, and then on the other side of that, and I'm getting a little far afield here, but it's important. On the other side of that, in, in consumer markets, you have thousands of small businesses and potential small businesses in retail, distribution, delivery, product development, manufacturing, wellness, hospitality, that are now you know, in legal states and medical states stuck waiting years for a steady, overpriced, non-sustainable supply chain that when, that when legalization happens is gonna go under anyway. Um, and so we're hurting a lot of independent and small and equity businesses um, in levels of the trade that have always existed in those states, right? I mean, I grew up in New York City and over a 20 year period in New York City, we arrested 430,000 people for cannabis, right? Just in the city. And 86% of them were, were, black, were black and Latino. And, um, and I can guarantee you that none of them were arrested for, for growing weed, right? None of them. They were arrested for retail distribution, delivery possession, right? The, the New York, just like most other consumer states, has had an industry for generations. I was buying cannabis, you know, out of bodegas and, and through mail slots, uh, you know, in the 80s. And, 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 but that industry has always been an import industry. And the industries out here have always been an export industry, right? When, when, when Oregon legalized cannabis, we did something that I think was very wise and very Oregonian. And that is we really tried to legalize the industry we had. Right. And the state even did a marketing campaign called Go Legal. And the message was not, you know, come in with your Canadian public money and buy up a bunch of land. It was we know you're growing, whether you're registered medical or you're unregulated, come into the legal market. We made licenses cheap and unlimited. Right. And thousands of people jumped in. Right. But what we didn't really think through when we legalized the industry we had here is the industry we had was an export industry and it had always been so. And 90% of the cannabis we grew here has always left the state, right? We have 4 million people here. We grow some of the best cannabis in the world. And we have 4 million people here, like a third of whom get their weed for free from their friends, right? We have a tiny market. And so we set up this situation where, you know, a politically created economic catastrophe. And then in 2017, we saw prices here go from 1800 a pound to $300 a pound outdoor in like 14 months, right? And, and Everyone was talking about, oh, we have this, we have an oversupply problem. We have an oversupply problem. And, and what I kept telling people, and I went to the legislature and I said, you don't have an oversupply problem. You have a market access problem. If we could access the markets we traditionally serve from here, we would need every ounce of cannabis we were growing legally and we would have to expand. And if you think about it as an oversupply problem, <coughs> then the answers you come to all hurt producers. The answers they come to are, how do we have fewer producers? How do we make them grow less? Right? How do we make it more difficult? But if you understand it as a market access problem, the answers you come to are how do we open the markets that we traditionally serve so we can have a flourishing industry that's broadly beneficial, bringing revenues into the state, creating thousands of jobs, right? And supporting, you know, and supporting thousands of small businesses. You know, California's got a slightly different problem because you know, they can't seem to get, you know, they have a bunch of problems, the tax issue, the, the local control, but also that they can't get retail a, a lot of retail license. And, and that goes back to, you know, 1996 when we, they legalized medical and the state decided to be hands off. And then 20 years later, they come back to a thriving industry and say, okay, now you have to be, now you have to, you know, get legal, put in all this money, pay 40% taxes and, and, the, and, the, and the retailers, you know, gave them the finger. And, and so here we are, you know, with Los Angeles with a couple of hundred licenses, you know, and everybody's forced to send, send you know, to sell all the legal, you know, product has to go into a small number of shops. And so, but one way or the other, what, I, what I've come to understand for both states is that if we don't open markets, consumer markets that this region serves, we are gonna wipe out the legacy, particularly the legacy producing regions and thousands of businesses, and they will never come back and they'll never recover. And we will have, you know, destroyed the soul of cannabis. And in the meantime, you know, we have patients in Florida that are stuck, you know, buying true leaf. Right or or you know or in the illicit market. Sorry, I went on a while. I, I apologize. No, that's that's why we're here <laughs> to have these discussions. There are no time limits. That's the thing. Excellent. Good. I feel better. Yeah, Pearson wanted to follow up. Yeah. Um. You made you you made uh 
Yeah, I mean, you made my point a few times over there. Um, in Alaska, we we when we had a, a citizens initiative, we completely xed out uh, big business in a sense of if you weren't um, eligible for the PFD, the permanent uh, funding uh, allowance or the, the the dividend, you couldn't be an investor. So. Uh, it, it pretty much cut out all corporations because no corporation with any type of uh, uh, good fed, uh, financial officer is, is going to start a business in, in Alaska. Um, <laughs> but on top of it, we also uh, really um, didn't pay attention to the to what cannabis really is and how it's grown to where we we allowed for $800 a pound in taxes flat rate from the from the um, cultivator $800 right off the bat per pound in a state that in like ATN mentioned Maine um, I'm familiar with Maine's uh, electric cost which is four times less than than Alaska's, uh, we're at 24 cent, uh, 24.22 cents a, a kilowatt hour, um, which is sig significant when we, it's it's uh, 10 degrees below zero right now on cannabis. Uh, as you probably know, it doesn't grow too well in that type of climate. Um, but we did, we did allow for uh, the underdog per se to, uh, get licenses. Um, all licenses from the last time I checked were under fifteen hundred dollars a pop, um, and there's not a huge enforcement um, profile here. The, we don't have uh, hundreds of uh, enforcement agents looking into our stuff, but um, it, it, it's something that that I I really think it is would be beneficial is is to be able to keep these small businesses uh, afloat. And I think that's something that uh, you mentioned there. And like I said, you, you've covered a bunch of topics there that I wanted to bring up and I, I appreciate it. I think you, 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 you said a lot of the things that I was gonna ask you. you. You answered a lot of the questions I was gonna ask you um, uh, prior to uh, your, your, your comments. And I really appreciate it. No problem. You know, I, I would add that, you know, we are, um, strongly supportive of local craft production wherever it is you know environmentally rational to do that right and so um we are not looking to uh you know to preclude or wipe out small local craft production you know, but you know but there are places in the country where growing at commercial scale is is not sustainable or or competitive right and and with these protected markets and the longer it goes, we ensconce, you know, these MSOs who can come in with, you know, $50 million and build a big facility and they will sell every ounce of cannabis they can grow for the first few years at the highest prices those states will ever see, right? And then, you know, and then use that to leverage, get, you know, to leverage control of retail, distribution, branding, shelf space, all of that. And then when the federal legalization happens and the doors come down, they will have the resources to shift their production out to, you know, Oregon or California or Medellin or wherever it is they want to, you know, grow. And, you know, and, and it's the small producers that, you know, have been incentivized, too many small producers in some of these places where it's not competitive to grow that have been misincentivized into putting a lot of money into this, who also take years longer to get licensed, right, in most places, right? It's easy to license the MSOs. They've got legal, they've got compliance experts, they've done it before. They have all the money they can come in and they get the first crack in most states, right? Clearly Alaska did it better. Um, and then the small producers take several years. There are people who are getting involved right now in, in states that commercial production isn't really competitive that are gonna be are gonna be not are gonna be non-competitive before they get a crop out of the ground, right? I mean, we're setting a lot of people up to fail. We need folks to understand that if you're gonna get into the production side, that you need to not just be able to sell cannabis you know, in your protected, artificially protected market, because that's temporary, right? Well, I mean, it may take eight years for the feds to legalize cannabis, but it could be three, right? And so, you know, you need to go in with your eyes open. Let's support and give incentive to local craft production, 
right? And market local craft production locally, right? But not, um, but not give, you know, this protected space for the MSOs to run wild and take over the industry. And if we end up with federal legalization and, and cannabis is dominated by a dozen companies who, by the way, whose business model, by the way, is to immediately sell out to pharma or tobacco or whoever is going to put that money in their pocket, right, will have destroyed the soul of cannabis, right? We're trying to create, you know, rational, sustainable marketplaces that can support local and also bring in the bulk of their cannabis in a lot of places, you know, that's competitive with the illicit market now while there is still small production happening. By the way, the fact that it's 10 below outside and you're sitting in your house in your t-shirt um, makes me happy. You have great insulation. And if I ever get up to Alaska, will you show me around the cannabis scene there? I will absolutely do that, sir. <laughs> and my, my, uh, my, uh, the person that puts up with me, Megan, she just got back from the, uh, the only cannabis cafe, uh, that she, she works behind the, uh, the counter for us. She'll also make you a coffee if you like caffeine. So nice. any, yeah, no, I, I, I've, I'm well, uh, uh, I, I've been around, I've been around the, the industry here. So anything, anything you, uh, would like to see, you let me know, come up anytime. Excellent. I heard you guys grow pretty good weed up there. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, no, no, I'm just joking. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, best in the world. We actually have the best cultivators in the world just migrate up to Alaska. I don't think there's any better. <laughs> uh, I, I've had some of the fine Alaskan grown when I was uh, married in Alaska. I had friends of mine as a legal grower, gave me a boutonniere. We put flowers uh, in my wife's bouquet and he gave me a big fat hog leg for the post-wedding ceremonies. So... Yeah, I, I, I'm a, a lover of Hawaii, of uh, Alaskan, but it also, you know, you bring up very interesting points, uh, which is the problem of a lot of these individual states is that you're you're stuck with what they have. You don't have the availability of choice. And here in California, you know, I am spoiled, but as well, I'm, I'm, you're correct in all of the over over regulation. But a state like Hawaii has uh, reciprocation. And by that, that I can actually take my medical card that I have here in California, send it to the state of Hawaii, and they actually, uh, by paying a fee around $40, then I have access, I, they provide me with a medical card to go into the dispensaries there. So I went to the dispensaries there, and the quality is good, but it could be better if it had competition. You know, uh, friends of mine in Louisiana sent a picture of a bud that was completely bleached on the top, which was all done through light burn, which is something that would never pass the quality standards. But this patient just paid an ungodly amount of money in the state of Louisiana after jumping through all the hoops to get an absolutely crispy burn top, which is literally a half of an eighth of wasted money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, quality is a, is a huge factor, uh, which I think, um, is a reality I think you've touched on because everybody has been looking through it through that prohibitionist uh, eye lenses. So they uh, look at the amount of money that was there. And unfortunately, a lot of these states got really greedy and their eyes were bigger than their britches. And because we did not have a previous access of of watching our industry actually come into the light, except for alcohol, it was totally different watching what happened with cannabis. We, and of course, I live in California, we can speak toward the problems there. And of course, you're in Oregon and the problems that are, that are there. But I thank you for speaking so concisely on the that issue, because I, I think that's something that isn't really being considered much by people. Um, but as we move on, um, uh, how does the effort uh, that you're working on uh, allow align with uh, federal reform? As we know, there's talk of descheduling, rescheduling, moving it past schedule two, uh, three to five. Um, as we see, as I stated earlier, you know, we've got uh, 18 states with you know another potential seven coming on board this year for legal adult use. Um, so. 
uh, how do what you're doing by talking about these packs because they're individually or going to be negotiated in between states uh how does that affect national reform and um what does your idea of alignment uh fall in place with where the movement is uh, headed in the direction that, that it currently is trajecting well you know like i said before and, and as you know etienne I, I got involved in this from the movement side and 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 a long long time ago feels like a lifetime ago and and um uh and and it has never been you know like i said waiting for the waiting for congress to fix cannabis has never been a winning strategy um what I think it aligns in that we want to get, we want to give the feds a running start, right? I looked at what came out of the, you know, I guess what's still a discussion draft, they haven't even introduced it yet in the Senate. And the first go of that was just terrible, right? I mean, let's hand it to the FDA, let's charge 25% tax. And, you know, I mean, it was, it was just a disaster. Um, and of course they brought it back and they're going to change it. And, you know, I don't have a lot of faith um, that the feds are going to come in if the feds came in tomorrow, uh, you know, and legalize that, that they would, we would end up with an industry that we want to see. Um, and so, but, but in a lot of the States, we have something that's closer to the industry that we want to see. We have there's problems. Um, but, but what we're really hoping is that by setting up a regulatory framework and getting actual commerce happening between States, um, you know, on the ground, that it will sort of hem in the feds as to what the what the Overton window is, right? What the possibilities are for how they're gonna uh, for how they're gonna regulate this, and we want to make it as easy as possible um, for the feds to pick up on what the states are doing, right? The state regulators, um, unlike the federal regulators, are, have been you know neck deep in this issue for quite a long time now. In some states, uh, they have you know the states themselves have a, have a real interest in the success of their industries. Uh, economically, and in a lot of states, um, you know, the the state government and and the regulators have been, you know, if not perfect and often quite flawed, have been supportive of a of a successful industry and understand, um, you know, out here uh, that the that the core of the industry is thousands of small businesses and not three or four MSOs. And so, um, what we're hoping to do is a not wait for the feds to get their shit together, um, but b to set a framework that will be active and live on the ground by the time the feds get around to legalizing so that, um, so that there is momentum toward an industry that we all wanna be a part of that we've had more of, a, more of a hand in being able to shape, right? We are, we are much more powerful at the state level um, than we will be once the, you know, we get around the federal table with a lot of interests that aren't even, um, you know, that aren't fully, you know, that aren't engaged at all at the state level yet. You know, a lot of very large interests and so, um, and so, you know, I have hopes for, you know, federal help and it would be nice to get, you know, banking, it would be nice to get a bunch of stuff, but I don't see federal legalization happening this cycle. Um, and I'm not sure what the midterms are, you know, that the midterms are gonna make things a lot better. Uh, and so, you know, what this project really was born out of is um, a decision not to wait for the federal government, that the way this has always happened is by state action that there is a pathway here to do it through state action and that we're gonna end up with a much better deal um, operating through the states and, and, and negotiating and lobbying through the states um, than waiting an untold number of years for the feds and then having the feds come in from zero and, and start, to, you know, start to make rules. What's well, interesting um, because uh, we saw today that the house passed uh, uh, the um, banking bill as part of a rider there. So we'll see if that continues into the Senate version, but it passed along party lines today. So we potentially have something happening on the horizon, but uh, you know, uh, snowballs, we'll see how that, that one goes. <laughs> it's, the, it's the sixth time the house has passed it. Right. I yeah, mean, I you know. know. And, well, and, you know, we'll, we'll come back to the Christian cinema, uh, Joe Man yes. situation again, unfortunately, <laughs> along party lines and, you know, fall out of place. But at the same time, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's still some time away. I think that, uh, you know, having a prohibitionist or an architect of prohibitionist policies in the White House hasn't been, you know, our best bet. But at the same time, it was, you know, a turd or a shit sandwich. And we all took a bite of the shit sandwich collectively. 
and uh, you know, uh, seeing what's happening currently and the inactions that were expected, um, you know, uh, it doesn't give me much hope. But at the same time, to see that the normal Republicans are the ones that are actually breaking uh, the bread and discussing things at the state level is uh, very uh, helpful to the cause nationally, depending on how things go in the future. So, you know, eternal vigilance is still a price of liberty, people. So stay involved, stay plugged in. Um, so can I, can I just, Etienne, can I just say one thing? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Um, the, you know, so I've been fighting against Biden on criminal justice and drug policy since the crime bill in 94. And I have no illusions about, um, you know, him as an ally, right? But, but he, but the, but one of the reasons that I really, dedicated, you know, full time to making this particular thing happen is that Biden was, was very clear um, that he wants to leave this in the hands of the states, right? I have no, I have no illusions that he wants to legalize. He's been clear that he doesn't want to see or sign a legalization bill. Uh, but he has said again and again, he said on the, on the campaign trail, and he has said since he's been in office, you know, that we are, we respect the state's rights to make, make decisions on this. I don't think Biden um, wants to legalize, but I also don't think he wants to get in the way. I don't, I don't think that he has at this point in his, uh, in his career and also in, in the political reality of where the Democratic Party is, I don't think he has any appetite for stepping in and stopping the states where they want to uh, move policy forward. And so I, I have strong, and, and, and to me, that's sort of, you know, a hole in the wall that we can drive a truck through, right? You know, if he's saying, we're going to leave this to the states, you know, and then I watch the entire industry spending and I, and of course we have to be involved in the federal conversation and every time that you know safe banking passes or every time there's a new federal legalization bill that conversation gets moved forward but at some level you know it, it becomes the it becomes the you know the federal cannabis lobbyist full employment act right we just keep arguing about you know we keep pushing and pushing on the on congress that it doesn't work on anything you know to work for us um and i think that that biden and and merrick garland has have clearly opened the door and said, you know, this is really a state issue and we're not going to interfere. So I think it's time for us to take that hint and to and to have the states push this forward. And I'm 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 fairly confident. I, I'm very confident on medical, but I'm fairly confident on adult use that if governors come and say, you know, we want to do this next thing, that they will say exactly the same thing. Where you're regulating, where the states are regulating, our concern is diversion, money laundering access to kids, actual illegal activity. And so we're, we're counting on that. And if Biden does nothing but that, and then we can leverage that and have the states, you know, start to create a much more, you know, just and, and functional industry, then he'll have done, you know, then he'll have done all we can really ask of a, you know, old school prohibitionist. Agreed, agreed. All right, so, um... I love this no time limit thing because I talk a lot and I, I can, I'm, I'm oh. starting to relax and not feel bad about that. Good. Well, you know, because <laughs> now comes the part where you get to be really long winded because, you know, what are the biggest challenges in this effort? Because you've been promoting this. Uh, we've met, we've had conversations over this over a year ago. Uh, you wrote me a check, which I appreciate. Yeah, of course. Still, to and, this day, I thank you before I go to bed at night. I, I, I appreciate it. No, it's what we do, you know, so. <laughs> This gives us an opportunity to educate others about, you know, I like to always look over the horizon, being those kind of visionaries that we are. And, you know, what are the biggest challenges that you see uh, right in front of you currently? Cure leaves. You know, not them alone, but the MSOs, right? The, the big challenge is the MSOs whose, whose business model and bottom line depends on artificial state silo protections and limited licenses um, who want nothing more than to keep those silos in place for as long as possible because they have a lot of money invested in you know overpriced you know environmentally unsustainable mass production in states where cannabis should not be grown at scale right that is that is our biggest that is i think the biggest hurdle um and you know uh but the truth is that those guys you know as big as they look from here in the industry are not are not politically powerful players in the overall, right? I mean, we're looking at cannabis, we're looking at a cannabis industry that, you know, we're hopeful, I think the last number I saw, we're hopeful in 2025 will be, you know, 25 to $30, million, $30 billion. Um, 
and go look at the farm, go look at pharma and the pharmaceutical industry. And that number is the revenues of like the 12th biggest pharmaceutical company, right? So even the biggest players in, in cannabis, um, you know, the true leaves or the, or the cure leaves, um, they are not, uh, you know, they're not that powerful. And um, because this is a state opt-in, we don't need every state, right? We just need, we just need one consumer state and one producer state governor to say, yes, we're going to agree on a, on a, on a, you know, on a regulatory framework. And once we are moving cannabis from one state to another, um, we've changed the entire conversation in cannabis and, and it becomes, you know, the, the siloed industries start to fall apart of their own, you know, of their own, the collapse of their own weight, right? Because if you're in a state and you're stuck with, you know, you're stuck with these, you know, six MSOs, you know, providing most of the legal cannabis and the state next door is getting, you know, Emerald Triangle weed for a third of the price, um, that's not politically gonna, gonna stand for very long. And so, um, so I think the, the MSOs are definitely um, already fighting against this, uh, but they don't worry me too much. Uh, the other big, the other big uh, hurdle is really just getting governors to uh, make this ask of DOJ. And I think we're going to make that happen this year. Well, we will hope for the best and of course yeah. rally around and behind you needless to say. So I will turn this over to uh, council member Krawitz. Thank you, Etienne. So a question has come up in the margins of our conversation as we're talking here, and it, it strikes me I need to uh, first say a word or two about the Veterans Action Council. Um, Veterans Action Council is unique, and and you know, you know me, and we've been working. I, I came in a little late, you know, after '94, I think '95. <laughs> So, but uh, I'm a newcomer. <laughs> Always will be, right? I'm the new guy. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, really, uh, Adam's one of my mentors, and and uh, and and uh, the work that uh, you know everybody did in and and continues to do with like DRC Net Foundation, SSDP, uh, you know, uh, some of the stuff in in Washington D.C. to this day that that definitely has a footprint from your work, and I thank you for that. Uh, and but I want to say that you know this is a little different. This isn't like an organization. It's not like Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access. There's no hierarchy. There's nobody in charge. Uh, that that you know at the end of the day it makes it some sort of line in the sand. This is a council of equals, and we come together as veterans from all over the country, and we do pretty well represent the whole country. In fact, we have veterans that will come on the call occasionally from other countries around the world, and uh, we have some of our veterans can speak for veteran service organizations. Many of them can speak for cannabis organizations and entities that work in the cannabis space. Uh, and those that, that aren't are, are some of the most badass cannabis activists in the, in the cannabis space. Uh, and, and our mentors, the veterans before us, like Jack Herr and Dennis Perrone and Timothy Leary and, you know, and uh, Louis Armstrong and et cetera, uh, we have, hell of a legacy of military veterans in the cannabis space hell of a legacy i mean it can't write a story about the cannabis space without writing a story of veterans in in, in not my opinion i'll state that as a fact and uh, uh but yet uh here, here we are you know and uh um i i just want to uh you know formally introduce ourselves in that way and and say you know uh we've been very careful about how we've talked about things and how we, we worked on things. We answered the, the call for discussion on the discussion draft in the Senate, for example, with what, what was it, 50 pages we submitted of well thought through uh, all footnoted documentation. And we did a similar uh, thing for the Safe Harbor Act and we intend to do so for the, uh, uh, the, the Graham Act and, and, uh, the, and other acts that, that are on the table um, in due course. And, and what you're presenting seems to be, and I'll be so bold as to speak for the council here, kind of a missing link to some of the stuff that we've been working on. Um, and, and I really appreciate your work in that regard and, and just, you know, basically like put us in coach, you know, what can we do? What can we do to help uh, uh, Veterans Action Council, you know, would like to know, you know, what, what can we do to help? Excellent. So, well, first of all, you, you started off by embarrassing me. You're, you are, your work, at, you know, UN and internationally is, is inspiring and incredible and when we get on the phone and you tell me about it i have to take notes because i can barely keep up um and you know and and what atn has done has been incredible so i'm you know honored to be here um 
So right now we have a coalition that is signing on to a, to a letter to ask these four governors. And since you represent folks in, in you know, all across the country, it's totally appropriate for you to sign on. Uh, National Normal has signed on and the, um, you know, a number of organizations throughout the four states. Uh, and we'd love to have you sign on to that ask of the governors to seek guidance from the DOJ, right? And that is really the first step. What, what, I, have, what I have found in my conversations um, the producer states understand their role and they understand their future and can't wait to get to it and understand that they, you know, that in a, in a, in a rational market, um, you know, we would be sending cannabis out uh, to markets around the country. But in the consumer states, um, uh, the answer has always been, well, that's a great idea and it may be the future, but the feds won't let us do it. And so, you know, there isn't the political oxygen to have a real conversation about what that might look like or getting their political leaders to, you know, to call for this. And so we really have to get, um, we really have to get DOJ uh, to give a response. And while I'd like to ask DOJ, um, they are not as impressed with me as, as you sound like you are. And so they're unlikely to answer. Uh, so we need to get governors to do that. So if you, if, 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 if the, if the council would be, um, you know, interested in signing on to that um, ask, and we're going to, we're going to officially make the ask of the governors probably a couple of weeks after the California bill drops. Um, and, but right now we are gathering support. So if you guys want to lend your name and, and your logo and your voice to this ask so we can find out if there is a state path um, to this, that would, be, uh, that would be tremendous. And then, you know, as part of the coalition, your voice going forward would be, um, you know, invaluable. Uh, you can't talk about cannabis without talking about veterans. And you certainly can't talk about medicinal cannabis and the need for access without talking about veterans and veterans voices, um, you know, are, are, you know, it's, it's a powerful reason why we need to do this, right? So many millions of patients sitting in legal states that don't have access to decent cannabis at reasonable prices um, is, is a disaster and, and we need to solve that. All right. Does anybody have any other follow-up questions after that? Um, we have a process, Adam. So what we'll do is uh, next Thursday, we'll bring up uh, that discussion for a vote uh, to get our sign on for our members uh, because uh, we have no head and we are basically a conglomeration of, of, of a think tank of awesomeness. Uh, we will um, put that to a vote and I can't see that not happening uh, but at the same time, you know, don't count us on it yet until we actually have actually voted on it. But uh, we'll be happy to take that forward and sign on. Uh, I think that's something that we can all get behind and understand the ramifications of what it is, as well as uh, we'll debate it and uh, have a lively discussion around it. And this has uh, gone a, uh, needless to say, a great way toward helping many of us understand what is actually happening, what is going on, as well as what are the possibilities? Where are we going from here? You know, what is possible? And so you've given us an idea through our own little Tenth Amendment realities that we of lenses that we look through to see what could happen if I could import or export you know, from all these other states, which I think are key components that people need to realistically consider as legalization starts to become more looming as, as time goes. You know, I think we're closer than ever. We're not close, you know, close enough there yet. However, you know, I think what we're working towards, you know, uh, internationally, as you know, we'll be hosting uh, two different uh, side events at the UN in uh, March. So uh, we'll be uh, with some of the things we'll be working on here in the future. But at the same time, I think this is something we could definitely uh, start talking more and make people more aware of. I know uh, education is probably something that uh, you still struggle with because you have to start people at a kind of a level playing field and see where they are because there's a lot of layers to this onion to, you know, grasp and get your mind around because you know most people when they th think of interstate commerce the first thing that pops into their mind is oh i heard of that's a charge that people get when they're arrested <laughs> it is it, there's a there's a bunch of moving parts to this and um you know one of my challenges has been uh you know people say send me a one pager and it's like actually i need to send you like a 10 page outline of like you know i've gotten it down lower than 10 pages but it, it, it takes a little bit 
right? It's a, it's a, it's a different approach. Um, but when you really think about it, it's the same approach we've always used, right? We're pushing to find out if states can take the next step. And that is always how it has gone. And we will get to federal legalization, uh, but we can't wait for federal legalization, you know, while we watch the collapse of the, of the traditional industry and while we have millions of patients who don't have access or who have, you know, crappy access. And there's absolutely no reason, um, you know, there's absolutely no reason, especially now that we have an administration that's been really clear that they want to let the states do their thing. This is it. So, I, you know, I, I really, I can't tell you how much I appreciate having the time to, you know, to, to peel back this onion and, and really explain what we're trying to do. And it, it's not all that complicated, but it is, you know, it, it, there are several pieces to it. And the first piece is let's find out from the feds if there's a path, if they'll stay out of the way. And, and I think the moment is right for that. And I think we're going to have a couple of governors um, that are going to, you know, help us make that happen. Well, the concept of sound, it's the execution when it gets all muckety-mucked. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for letting us all find that rubber to find the road there. And uh, needless to say, it's an honor, Adam, to have you. And please come back again and uh, update us on things as they go into the future. And uh, we'll keep you updated as we uh, take this forward as a uh, a vote here in the upcoming uh, meeting that we have. So Excellent. we'll be in touch very shortly. Uh, I, would, I would like to- uh, and I was just gonna say, if, if there's yeah. anybody here who is associated with other organizations that feels like they might be interested in also um, supporting this effort uh, by signing on, um, just go to statescantwait.org um and uh there there's the the sign on right there i actually have to update some of our newer partners uh but um there's a letter there uh i am working on again because of i'm working on making the letter to the governors more brief than it is there but the letter that we send to the governors will be will be substantively exactly what's there so you'll you'll be able to look at it and if you are part of an organization and you would like me to come uh have a conversation with your leadership or your membership about what this is about please get in touch with me. You can get in touch with me at um, adam at sensiblemarkets.org. And I'd be thrilled to make the time to, um, to meet with folks individually or in groups. And again, that statescantwait.org. So yep. if there's any affiliates, and of course, many of us have different affiliates that we are associated with. So please. Uh, and again, that's uh, adam at sensiblemarketsplural.org. So yep. Uh, again, can't thank you enough for being here tonight. I'd like to also thank our council members, Michael Krowitz, uh, Kendra biller Sowie, Pearson Kennedy Crosby, the George Armstrong, uh, Aaron Pluff, and needless to say, Wade Laughter. Oh, it's so good to see you. You sound so strong and so happy to, to hear you. We love you. Thinking the best. You look great. How are you doing? If you got a second. Better by day, day by day. Actually, a lot of good news. At some point, I'd be glad to tell you about it. But right. yeah, heading in the right direction, Etienne. Thanks for asking. I can hear the strength returning in your voice, and it, uh, needless to say, it fills my soul with joy. So I, I am, you know, that's the best present I've gotten all week. So it's good to see you. Uh, happy to have you around, and uh, I'm glad to see you're kicking cancer's ass all over the place. So. We love you. Anything we can do, you please uh, let us know. You reach out. And with that, this will wrap up our Veterans Action Council Roundtable number 30, Interstate Commerce and Cannabis, why it matters to you now. So now you do. Now you understand. So we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, we have a very special guest, uh, Alice O'Leary Randall. The uh, Miss Randall was, of course, married to Robert Randall, who was patient zero, the first patient to receive medical marijuana, and she has been our godmother uh, and uh, kind of taken care of us as uh, she uh, helped us with our green paper that we put forward. And we're going to have her for a very interesting and entertaining discussion. So we'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you all very much. Much love. Peace out.